Thank you so much. All right, I'd like to get going. Thank you so much for showing up on such a cold, snowy day. The snow feels like, it sounds like styrofoam. Mm -hmm. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Elaine Tron and I'm the director of CARLA and I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Nina Garrett. Nina's been the advisor on CARLA's Language Resource Center LIGDO project for several rounds now, um, beginning back when she was still working at Yale, uh, being, being the dance artisan of Yale. <laughs> <laughs> directly from the provost, apparently, to offer teachers all kinds of wonderful leaves and study project things to show you more about it. So um, she had quite an impact on the quality of language teaching at Yale. Um, last fall, Dan and I went to the CLAC conference, Cultures and Languages Across the Curriculum, that was being held at Skidmore. And Nina had been invited to be a plenary speaker there. We loved her talk. It was a big hit. And we asked her to update it and give it for you here today. So without further ado, Nina Garrett. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. It's always a pleasure to come back to Minnesota. As I said, I've been coming, working with Carla for quite a few years now. So that there are a lot of people here whom I recognize. And it's always a privilege to come back and, and have a chance to, to talk with you. Um, CLAC, Cultures and Languages Across the Curriculum, is certainly an area in foreign language education that is growing, but it's still something of a fringe endeavor. Um, you'll be hosting your own conference on it following up on the Skidmore one. There's brochures right there. Um, in early March, and I hope that a lot of people find it possible to go to this and hear uh, a number of people talking from a number of different institutions about a wide range of approaches to doing cultures and languages across the curriculum. There's still, I think, a fair amount of confusion in the foreign language world at large about exactly what this entails, what does it mean, what does it, what does it translate into in, in programmatic terms. And so I thought I'd spend a little time talking about different varieties or different approaches to languages across the curriculum. At Yale, we called it capital L, small x, capital C. It's also known as CLAC and LAC and FLAC, foreign languages across the curriculum. The latter I find particularly on euphonious. <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> So there are a number of different ways that um, institutions have, have gone about trying to create this kind of amalgam of cultural content and foreign language teaching. In many places, there are departments that teach um, courses, language literature departments that teach courses on what you might call area studies um, for upper level students, especially those in other departments who don't have the language capability to do it in the foreign language, they teach these courses in English, so that you will have a departmental course on Italian opera, or French film, or the German economy, or something like that. The courses like these are very often meant for majors in area studies, sometimes in institutions that have national resource centers or area studies councils. Such courses are offered through that particular venue. Typically, of course, there are also upper level courses in, in English in the language literature departments on literature and translation. And sometimes there's a little bit of tug of war with English departments that feel that courses in translation um, belong in English departments. That's something I'm not going to get into here. But so you will often find something like cultures and language across the curriculum in foreign language departments that are teaching courses in English on history, film, linguistics, you know, the history of the language, or the syntax of the language, anthropology, environmental studies, sociology, political science, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one way of doing languages and the, the, the cultural content of a particular language area. The emphasis in these, obviously, is on culture rather than language. The courses are taught in English. Sometimes there's a special section, but I'll get into that in, in a moment. Um, um, 
there, uh, a more traditional model for a language across the curriculum, I think, is one that um, has been modeled in various ways on the work of Stephen Strait at the University of Binghamton, right? Um, where you have courses in non-language literature departments that focus on one particular world area or one particular language area. And in those cases, then, there's very often a special section. There's a, like, lectures are in English, but there's a special section where the language work, uh, where some of the students can optionally can choose to be in a language program, where, very often, then, the TA who teaches that particular section is a native speaker of the language um, of the cultural area that is being referred to. And these can be extremely effective. Um, and there are a lot, a lot of different ways of providing extra credit for universities that allow extra credit. Yale, for example, doesn't. Um, so it's purely the interest of the students um, motivated to take on the language work. The problem with these, this particular model is that in the add-on sections, the TA in charge, the native speaker TA, typically has no language pedagogy background at all. This is a TA in history, or a TA in sociology, or a TA in whatever it may be, who is a native speaker of the language, but does not have the, the pedagogical background. And typically, these are one-off things, where there's no continuity from one year to the next, and there's no curriculum building. It's just catch as catch can. If we have enough students, if we have enough uh, that are interested, that can do it at this level, great. It's also typically limited to commonly taught languages and to the mid majors, where you can pull together enough students that will do this. One of the most successful ones in Yale was um, Chinese sociology, which really sort of <laughs> pulled together a very interesting group of people. The teacher, the, the professor who taught the course, was a native speaker of English who read Chinese fluently, but who didn't speak it. But there were a number of students in the course on contemporary issues in Chinese sociology um, who were native speakers. And typically, there were enough students in the course because Yale has a donor who provides a bottomless pit of money for students to study in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. <laughs> so you had plenty of students coming back from China who were not Chinese literature majors, who were sociology majors or political science majors or whatever. So it was a, a good group for um, language across the curriculum sections of this kind. So that's, as you can see, very much happenstance, very much catch as catch can in any particular institution, in any particular department, in any particular language. Now, another model, and this is the one that, that I tend to um, think is likely to be the most successful with all kinds of caveats about support, which I'll go into later. And that is the notion of doing, please, um, of having language departments teaching upper level courses on topics other than literature. Language for special purposes, this is sometimes called. I, or sometimes it's language for specific purposes, whatever, it's LSP. Um, I always tend to bridle at the notion that everything that isn't literature is considered special purpose. The literature is the fallback, and anything else is somehow uh, specially designated. What's interesting about these courses is that they're, they're typically taught by language teaching faculty, usually the non-tenured ones, as, as this happens at, at many, many universities, um, who happen to be both native speakers of the language and professionals in that particular area. So that they may have gravitated into language teaching because they couldn't find a job as a lawyer, a doctor, a whatever. And most of them, at least at, at places that do national searches for language teachers, as, as Yale does, they're excellent language teachers, and they're not hired on a one-year basis. They're hired on a continuing basis. They're full-time. They have full benefits, they, et cetera, et cetera. The Center for Language Study, which I was happily the founding director of at Yale, provides all the professional development that they needed. Um, so you have a real card-carrying professional teaching an upper-level course in the language in that particular discipline. So for example, at Yale, the Spanish department had a Spanish lawyer who was a superb language teacher and adored language teaching, and she taught Hispanic legal systems. We similarly had courses by people who were professionals in um, media and journalism, um, in um, film direction, 
And uh, we had a medical Spanish, of course, which is probably the most common. Um, and so there was a whole variety. Again, having these people available is likely to be possible pretty much only in the commonly taught languages, where you have a broad enough spectrum of faculty and a broad enough spectrum of students. Now, the interesting thing about the student population in these is the following. I don't know whether it resonates for you, but I think it's very often the case that students from good high schools will often do advanced level work in the language in the high school, especially if they have a chance to do AP work, as a way of getting out of the foreign language requirement when they get to university level. It's a very common practice. You talk to a lot of AP teachers and you find out that this is what they have in mind, what the students have in mind. Typically, if you look at the, the population, the, the, the demographics of the language programs in most large research universities, you'll find that most of the language literature majors don't come out of the university's own first year and second year language programs. They come out of the advanced placement kids who really want to go on with the language and who don't take the first and second year courses or the, the foreign language requirement, the FLR courses. Those are the ones that are taken by the students who didn't have enough language in high school proficiency out and who were simply interested in getting through the foreign language requirement as fast as possible and dropping language thereafter. So there's huge attrition in many, many languages for this, precisely this reason. So the students who enroll in the upper level language courses, which are non-literature courses, are then very often the students who want advanced work in the language but are not planning to be literature majors and don't have anywhere else to go for the language work that they need. That's where language with special purposes language across the curriculum really comes into its own. Now, I don't mean by any means to denigrate the study of literature here. In fact, some of the most interesting courses that have been developed in literature departments recently, and you find you know, presentations on these at the MLA and so on, are courses that really look at the, the mesh of literature and some professional focus. That is, novels about um, medicine or law legal problems in a certain language, in a certain culture, um, have, have really proliferated. So that is a, a way of understanding what all of us understand intuitively, which is that no matter what profession it is that you're getting into, no matter what discipline, no matter what job you're in, that understanding the literature of the culture that you're dealing with is a sine qua non of being functional as a grown-up in that culture. Um, years and years ago, it's already must be decades ago now, that John Grandin developed his program at the University of Rhode Island on a double degree program for German and engineering where there were summer, summer institutes that the students would get into that did German, <coughs> excuse me, with German companies that had branch offices in the US, and then later with multinational firms in Germany, where they could really do their engineering work in Germany and become part of this. John was very proud of the fact that so many of the students that did this double degree program were engineering students who were taking lit courses in Goethe because it was so clear to them on the basis of their internships and their time that understanding the literature was an essential part of being a functional engineer. What a concept. <laughs> so please don't get the idea that I'm saying, you know, we should all stop teaching literature courses and do language across the curriculum, upper level courses and other topics instead. I'm not at all. It seems to me that we need to reorient our thinking about how literature and culture and language really belong together. Um, the, the, the MLA um, piece on sort of restructuring the, the modern language curriculum that came out, what was it, 2008? I think it was that. Seven. Seven, good God. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, perpetuated rather than um, getting rid of a distinction which is, I think, fairly common in language and literature departments, which is that courses in literature are intellectually sophisticated in a way that courses in humanities <coughs> are not. I know that there are many departments that have gotten beyond this, and I don't by only any means want to sort of tar all of um, language education with the same brush. But it is certainly the case that in some universities, 
the literature faculty will actively oppose the teaching of upper level courses in anything other than literature. And the, the MLA talks about the difference between constitutive, by which they mean the intellectual, intellectually sophisticated, and the instrumental, which you can tell right away is a denigrated sort of term. I find this so outrageous as to make me start frothing at the mouth. Because in fact, if you stop to think about it, our universities give PhDs and other advanced degrees in economics, business, medicine, law, architecture, music, you name it. So why is teaching these topics in another language intellectually unworthy? It, it's impossible to argue that it should not be a way of motivating students and maintaining um, uh, our, our demographic continuation of language learning. How do we make it work? Well, there is, of course, a, a valid contrast of opinions as to when we ought to start teaching languages across the curriculum. At what point do you start um, making the content of your language programs specific to some discipline, some profession, some area of, of cultural activity? There are those who would argue that we should not be doing this until after you know, the whole introductory foreign language sequence, i.e., say, three semesters. There are others who say that there's no reason why we couldn't be doing this from the beginning. Um, there are valid differences of opinion here. My own feeling is we might as well be doing it from the beginning when we have populations of students that really can take advantage of it. Um, because there's no particular reason why, at the post-secondary level, we need to assume that all of our learners are interested in teenage music and sports and the vegetables in the market. I mean, there's a certain amount of that which everybody <laughs> needs, but we don't need to treat all of our language learners as interested primarily in that for three semesters worth, or even just one, maybe just one. Anyway, this is something that can be argued about and should be argued about. It's a perfectly valid way of looking at what it is we want to introduce in our curriculum. So the contrast between that argument and another piece of the language across the curriculum picture is really quite interesting in that a common way of introducing um, content, quote unquote, as if, that's another one that makes me froth in the mouth, as if language were not content, excuse me, um, is the whole concept of graduate reading courses where graduate students are required to do, to pass certain exams, they're called reading exams, but basically they're usually translation, um, in order to qualify for their PhD purposes. The notion is that they should be able to read in their discipline, in the area for which they're doing their PhD. But in my experience, a great many of those reading courses are very much all purpose with a class mixed in of students from half a dozen or a dozen different disciplines, um, where the idea of reading as an independent skill is not connected with the particular content of the reading courses that they're supposed to be doing. There's a very interesting article in the Chronicle some years ago, some time ago, two years ago, I think, called Reading is Not a Skill, where the argument was that, um, and, and I buy it, I don't know about you, again, this is one where there are valid differences of opinion where the argument is that reading is so context and content dependent that it cannot be taught as a skill independent of some particular content area. When we're talking about doing that, we are, of course, talking about language across the curriculum. How do we build this into our concept of what our language programs and our language curricula are about? Ideally, it seems to me, we want to be able to offer the possibility of language learning to any of our students, undergraduate or graduate, in any combination of language X plus discipline Y. Now, in practice, of course, that's pretty far-fetched, especially when we're talking about the really less commonly taught languages. But one of the things that we need to say up front is the kind of institutional support that's necessary to build even a beginning program in this way. One of the things that I liked best about my position as director of language study at Yale was that from the outset, the whole notion of the position was envisaged as being across the entire curriculum, and I mean undergraduate as well as graduate, so that my appointment was under the provost's office, not under the dean's office. 
and I had a very clear mandate to talk to the deans of all 10 graduate professional schools at Yale with the idea of working out what did their students need. And I'd like to suggest, in fact, that this is a question that a university like Minnesota should be asking, too. This is a flagship university. This is one of the major public universities in the entire country. You're turning out world leaders for the 21st century. How do you envisage your students being, all right, this sounds childish, but OK, I'll say it, real card-carrying grown-ups in another culture? Do you want your engineers to be able to work abroad? Do you want your public health people to work abroad? Do you want your environmental people to work abroad? Do you want your political scientists, your economists, your philosophers to be able to work in the international community? If so, we've got to get started at some point. And we typically don't do that in most of our language curricula. So how do we make this work? One thing, one institutional thing that, has, that occurred to me a long time ago is that institutions tend to evaluate their departments by the number of majors. This is utterly wrong-headed, in my opinion, in, in terms of foreign language education. Granted, the literature major is an extremely important part of any liberal arts curriculum and needs to go on being so, but the use that a foreign language department is to its campus goes so far beyond the number of majors, goes so far beyond the provision of the courses that get them through the foreign language requirement, that it, it's difficult to argue that uh, the <coughs> number of majors, or even the number of minors, or even the number of double majors that a department turns out is any valid indication of how the department actually functions, functions on the campus as a whole. If we are to think about all of our students with any major playing an important role, being a leader, being a card-carrying grown-up in this world in the 21st century, then we need to think way beyond that perspective on foreign language departments and how they operate. So that's one institutional problem that I think needs to, can be addressed right away. And there's this focus on understanding the transition from the undergraduate to the graduate world as being a seamless continuum in, the, in language learning is, is, is crucial, I think. When you get beyond that kind of support, the next question, of course, is what kind of technology do you need? What kind of set of language center? What kind of, um, yeah, technology? That's so broad a term that it sort of leads you right into the question of, OK, what kind of model are you talking about? What kind of programmatic? model are you thinking about? Are you talking about the lower level courses? Or are you only talking about advanced level courses? And are you talking only about what's happening within the language departments, or across the campus, or across a group of campuses, and so on? One model that we came up with at Yale when we were trying to think this through was a pro program which we call FIELDS. Um, nice name, but actually stands for, if I can remember correctly, I wasn't the one who sunk it up in the first place, um, damn it, I'm liking it. Uh, yeah, something. Anyway, language discipline studies was the LDS part of it. I'm embarrassed, but okay. Um, <coughs> we, just, we created this program for students who had already completed the foreign language requirement in some language um, and who really wanted to do advanced level work in that language, in, specifically in their discipline. We thought of it first in connection with the transition to the flagships. I think most of you are familiar with the flagship concept, that there are institutions that have flagships um, that are funded by the federal government, to whatever extent, I don't know, um, uh, in, in one particular language and one particular cultural area, where they're really hoping to attract students who are already at a national, at a um, um, Defense Language Institute or Foreign Service Institute level of three, i.e. an actual superior. Well, we all know from statistics for years that most foreign language majors from universities like Yale or Minnesota or any other don't turn out threes. That is, we don't turn out students that are really eligible for flagship work. 
And so the original idea when we were um, thinking up this program at Yale was to provide something, some kind of a structure that would get really interested students up to a level three so that they could then enter a flagship if that's what, what they wanted to do, or be really active professionals in their field. So we really designed a program which was fairly customized, I mean, one-on-one. -on -one. Originally, we had hoped that we could expand it into a program that would be a combination of any language X plus any discipline Y, but there are, of course, limits in getting something like that going. But what we provided was intensive mentoring, either with a faculty member in the appropriate department or discipline on campus, or if we couldn't find one on campus, with someone at another campus who was um, a, a ref, uh, referred to us by a Yale faculty member. And intensive courses in the language that focused on teaching the students how to find the materials that they needed. Now, that's one of the interesting things about language across the curriculum that I think actually could and should be translated into all of our language programs, not just special LIC courses. And that is the whole idea of teaching students to use the resources at their disposal for the purpose of language learning. Now, there, I don't know if any of you have seen this um, Chronicle of Higher Education special issue on online learning. Um, it, it's fascinating. There's only one article in it on foreign languages, and <clears throat> don't quote me, but I don't think a lot much of it. Um, but one of the interesting articles in it is called The Myth of the Tech Savvy Student, where I think the points made are really excellent, and that is most of the kids know how to use cell phones. Most of them know how to text. Most of them know how to use the internet in fairly superficial ways. But the fact that they have that kind of superficial familiarity with the technology does not in any way mean that they know how to use the technology for the purpose of learning, let alone for the purpose of language learning. So what a number of people have worked out in individual programs and individual departments is that we need actually in our language courses, I would say preferably at the end of the second semester, but that's just my opinion. Students need to know how to email, print, text, chat, Skype in their language. Do we teach our students that in our routine, routine language courses? Some of us, yes, but not very many. There's no quote unquote, no time for this. But more than that, when you're getting to a professional level, what does it mean to go to a conference in another country in that language, in your field? What does it mean to present? How do you interact with your professional colleagues in this language, more than just meeting for a drink at the bar and breaking into English? What does it mean to search archives? How do you know what's available to you and what isn't? as a member of the public at large or as a member of a professional group? What, is it, what kind of professional interactions, what kind of engagement, and what kind of sociolinguistic level do you have within a specific discipline? More than that, there's the recognition, and this I think is, is hard to come by, is the recognition that in different cultures and different languages, the knowledge of a given discipline, discipline is organized differently. Knowledge is not knowledge across cultural boundaries. Disciplines are not the same disciplines across cultural boundaries. Years ago, I was in England for a year and at the University of Reading and realized to my surprise that psycholinguistics, in which I'd done my dissertation, well, I thought I knew something about it. In England, psycholinguistics is clinical speech pathology. That's what the field is. And of course, that's not what I had anything to do with at all. So knowledge is organized differently. Searches work differently. The kinds of materials that are available to you as a member of the public, as a member of a discipline, are organized differently. Are we teaching our students about this? That's part of languages and cultures across the curriculum. Every language ought to be, every language program ought to be making this kind of support available to the students across the entire campus. And if we go to the department chairs and the DU, DUSs and the DGSs of the departments in the university, let alone to the graduate colleges, 
I think we would very quickly find out what it is that our students are not graduating with in our language programs. How can you do this on an individual university or individual department level? Well, there are ways of getting started that are actually fairly straightforward, making use of your own institutional resources. A university like Minnesota must have <coughs> dozens, if not hundreds, of faculty members in departments across the university that are native speakers of other languages. Are we making use of them? What about all of the visitors that come to campus? This has been a dream of mine since I was at the University of Illinois, and Rick knows how long ago that was. Um, how about all of the visitors that come from foreign countries to give presentations or sem seminars or whatever at, at, at your university? How many of them come from areas that are languages that are taught in this country? What would happen if we had a little centralized network where every department knew that the Center for Language Study or the Language Center, whatever it is you've got, knew was really interested in any foreign visitor that spoke a language that's taught at our university and notified us three weeks, three months ahead of time so that we would have time to write a courteous letter to this speaker in astrophysics or molecular biology or philosophy, I don't care what, and say, I understand that you're going to be coming to my university to give a presentation on such and such a date. Um, we would be greatly honored if you would allow us to interview you just for an hour or so in speaking in your language. We don't actually care very much whether you talk about astrophysics or about summer vacations when you were a child or your mother's favorite recipes. We just like to have some conversation with you in your language, which we could use with our students. How, what kind of a, what kind of an archive could you build up in a very short period of time? Oh, and my hunch is that, okay, this is completely speculative. My hunch is that nine out of ten people would be delighted and would say yes right away. You got a facility for this? It happens. When you put this kind of material in front of a student who is interested in that field at an advanced level already. It's wonderful material. It's, it may be not quite authentic in the sense of authentic meaning developed by and for non-native speakers, but it's pretty close since your astrophysicists are not likely to have a whole lot of language pedagogy organizing their particular presentation. But one of the next levels of challenge that we, that we have to look at is what are the students ready for? What, the, what, what kind of language learning can happen when they are faced with these kinds of materials, whether authentic or not. And in fact, there's been a lot of debate about the assessment of language achievement, proficiency, whatever, that you get as a result of participation in any of the models of language across the curriculum that we're talking about. There have been articles trying to evaluate that for 20 years in, in the publications, um, from NLJ on up. Um, however, it's very commonly the case and again, this is no denigration, but it's a distinction that I think we need to make. For a lot of the students who are participating in a standard add-on section in the language for a language across the curriculum course that's in some other department, they get the chance to use the language at whatever level they're capable of, but because the person teaching it is not a language pedagogy person, it's unlikely that their language proficiency will actually increase. They may broaden out considerably. There's sort of a, a horizontal expansion of their language ability rather than a vertical one. And that's fine. God knows that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. But if we're talking about preparing students to go to a flagship or to go on to whatever the next level of study is, we also want to pay attention to the assessment of the increase of language proficiency that you can have under what kinds of circumstances. And here again, I mean, I'm <clears throat> unfortunately notorious for having said, yes, but for what students, in what languages, at what kind of, an, uh, what kind of language learning purpose um, uh, can you actually do valid research? Your, your comparison of apples and oranges is something that plagues this kind of methodological or evaluative studies. So we need to pay attention, certainly, to those questions. But we need to start somewhere. And putting together some program that addresses some aspect of these possibilities and then looking at how it works. The student population 
is not going to be able to take advantage of everything that we could conceivably offer without a good deal of help in learning how to learn. Learning not only how to use the technology, but learning how to think about what language learning really entails, rather than simply having it put before them in terms of workbooks and even the communicative activities that our programs put together. So that kind of attention is equally important with the attention to the kind of professional development that the teachers need in order to be able to teach at this level for these purposes. Beyond that, however, we've got a very serious problem, and that is materials development. Um, there are a number of templates, some of them developed at Yale under a, a FIPSI grant that we had, um, for working, for helping teachers develop pretty sophisticated materials for dealing with authentic materials um, for, for dealing with, uh, with students in whatever language. And there have been a lot of materials developed there, as there have been through CARLA. Um, but the question is, to what extent can the students make use of this without a huge amount of self-discipline and self-instruction? Um, some of you know about the DILS program that I started at Yale um, in the Center for Language Study. DILS meaning Directed Independent Language Study. We were going to call it something like self-instruction, but I was informed gently by the provost's office that when you charge upwards of $50,000 for tuition every year, parents don't want to hear that the kids are being asked to do self-instruction. So I had to find a different title for it. Directed Independent Language Study was a lot better. And in fact, of course, it was not self-instruction in that the students were not working at their own pace, and they had regular contact with native speakers, and they had a regular syllabus to keep to, and they had very hardcore evaluation at the end of it. So there, this was work in the extremely less commonly taught languages. Yale actually has 50 on the books. I think you probably still have at least 50, maybe even more. Um, I don't know, but anyway. Um, I'm proud to say, by the way, <coughs> that, Dills, uh, that uh, Yale finally did, after years of having Dutch be one of the most asked for languages in Dills. My mother used to teach Dutch at Yale 40 years ago. Um, we finally now have a full-time lecturer in Dutch. So that's a great pleasure to me. And there, again, these, the, the organization of the programs in the least commonly taught languages tends to follow very much the student interest. The DILS program, where we got native speakers, most of the students who were wanting to do the least commonly taught languages were interested in healthcare. And just by happy coincidence, most of the native speakers of the least commonly taught languages that we could find in New Haven were from the Yale Med School. So there was a wonderful serendipity coming together there. This cannot be left to happenstance if we're going to make it an essential part of our language programs. OK, so we need the templates. But here we get another institutional infrastructure question. And this is one that has you know, um, worried me for increasingly for the last couple of years. Um, more and more institutions are taking it for granted in ways that I don't think they're justified in doing, that their students really are tech savvy in the sense that they can make use of the language, of the technology, to learn whatever they need to learn, and that teachers don't really need to do anything more than think of interesting communicative activities for the students to do on their cell phones or via Facebook or whatever. And so the consequence of an institution thinking this way it has been, across the country, uh, the elimination of language centers and the elimination of where it should, of course, be strengthened rather than eliminated, and the elimination of professional development for the language teachers in supporting <laughs> things like um, how to teach using technology, and how to develop materials. The net result has been that materials development initiatives across the country are all but dead. There simply is not the funding for this that there used to be. And so the, the support for the teachers who want to develop materials, either for the less commonly taught languages or for special purposes even in the commonly taught languages, the support that most institutions have has, is dwindling. Now, you are, if I may say so, phenomenally lucky in your language center and your language center director. You've got a functional support structure here, which not very many universities have anymore. Yale still does. Thank goodness they hired another Dutch woman to head about that. <laughs> <laughs> so the you know the title of this talk, which came from you know as as 
Lynn said, the, the talk that I gave at, at Skidmore just over a year and a half ago was an ambitious agenda for cultures and languages across the curriculum. What I really want to say is, this is an ambitious agenda for foreign language education. And it's my personal feeling that languages across the curriculum is perhaps the most, I don't want to even say perhaps, I will put, my, put myself on the line. I think it is genuinely the most promising avenue towards turning around the current down cycle that we're in in this country in foreign language education. We were on a very good track until the economy crashed in 2008. There was a lot of interest in less commonly taught languages. There was a lot of interest in you know, internationalization, although that, that, was, that term varies across campuses. So the, I really think that if it had not been for the um, economic difficulties that so many of our universities, especially the great state universities, fell into as a result of the economy, I think we would be in a very different place as far as foreign language education is concerned. As it is, we're fighting a downward trend. If you've been in the field as long as I have, we've seen cycles. But uh, this is not a happy one right now. But I really do believe that motivating students to see the potential of language learning at an advanced level in their specific area of interest is the most promising way that we've got of lowering our attrition rates and raising the number of students who are doing languages truly across the country <coughs> for a whole variety of 21st century purposes. <laughs> said it, but I, I didn't follow it. Um, you brought up what was, to me, a new idea that uh, these courses are good in broadening what the students can do, mm -hmm. but may not actually raise their yeah. right their uh, their level in terms of FS. Yeah, right, whatever guidelines you're using. But I never heard what we do about that. Ah, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm sure you said it, I just No, didn't I didn't actually, right, right, you told me on that one. Um, I think that what we do about it is um, discipline by discipline, sociology, political science, you name it, environmental engineering, public health, we start creating databases and material banks of materials that will challenge the students to go beyond where they are now. That's one thing. The other is we want our, we want these courses, regardless of what rubric they're being taught under, to be taught by people who have language pedagogy training and support. We want people who understand second language acquisition as a discipline and who have real training in professional development and in language pedagogy. Um, it is unfortunately the case across the country that too many of the people who are in charge of language programs do not have this kind of background themselves. We're training our graduate students with their RTAs and the amount of time that has gone into orienting them and training them and evaluating them has gone down across the country year by year. And some institutions, bless them, still have full week-long orientations. Others are cut down to a single afternoon. And it has been infamous in language education for decades that TAs at many institutions are handed a textbook and told, this is your teaching course, this is your schedule for the year, you know, go teach these courses, um, without the kind of pedagogical support that they need, not only to be effective teachers of our undergraduates, but also to themselves develop as professionals and to think about their own language teaching. Um, God knows the Ivies are as bad about this or possibly much, much more than most other institutions. And I, over the years that I was at Yale, I had any number of department chairs from other departments say to me, you know, your graduate students from whatever language <coughs> always show up on our short list when we're doing searches for a new, a new assistant professor in our language department. But they seldom make the grade because they have no idea how to talk about their teaching. 
They have no idea how to think about their teaching. They have not been trained as teachers. They have been trained to write the world's most brilliant dissertation on Hassim. So until we begin taking that kind of professional development, professional support seriously, so that people with that kind of training are doing the language across the curriculum courses, um, we're, we're not going to be able to do the, the sort of the raising of the proficiency level. I do think that in institutions and in departments where you have the kind of situation that I was so proud of at Yale, um, in Spanish, for example, where you've got top-level professionals in their profession who are also top-level language teachers and really experienced language teachers with the kind of professional development support that they need. I think, you know, we did phenomenal things. Um, and and you, we had it, I don't mean to say that it was only in Spanish because there were individual people in other language departments as well. Spanish was the only one that was big enough to you know, have a real cadre of this. And that is too often the case. But until we start developing the kind of national movement that I think the CLAC conferences and the, and the, the, the organizations of people that are trying this in different ways, until we develop a kind of hmm, virtual center some way of organizing a kind of exchange of information about these courses and start building materials and databases. Start using, creating networks of people who are willing to contribute to this. Someone in political science in Zulu, at whatever university, who's willing to be a mentor. One hour per week, one hour every two weeks, I, you know, whatever. We've got Skype now, you guys. We've got a whole lot of instruments that make this kind of collaboration possible that allows us to start creating the infrastructure to build the whole effort, and not just horizontally, but vertically. But it, you know, it's going to take that kind of organization. Yes? I'm, I fully subscribe to your, to your goals and objectives, and I'm, I'm, but I'm trying to, what I'm seeing and what I'm when we implement these programs, but I'm, I'm seeing hurdles, and I'm, I'm going to ask you how to overcome those hurdles. One of them is the disciplinary hurdle. It mm -hmm. seems to me that a lot of disciplines simply function in English. Yes. Yes, there is French sociology, there is Spanish sociology, but really, if you go to a sociology conference in, in France, yes. they speak English. Yes. Um, my prime example, and you've mentioned it, the, the Dutch one, the, American Association for Netherlands Studies meets yeah. every two years. I have never, ever, ever in my 20 years seen one presentation in Dutch. No. no I so how do you overcome that hurdle? Okay. There, there, there is this disciplinary. Problem. That is that is certainly a problem. And that, and there are plenty of people problem. in other countries who think that you know English is the way it happens. And right. That, right. And the second problem to overcome is American professors do not speak the languages themselves. That's right. That's a huge problem. I mean, what are you going to do with this? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, um, let me give a feeble attempt at, at responding to this. Um, the first one, it seems to me, is actually a little bit easier to respond to. That is, yes, it's certainly true that if you go to professional conferences, goodness knows in the Netherlands, but all the rest of Europe, um, that most of the conference will take place in English. And in fact, there are universities in the Netherlands that are now conducting their entire curricula in English, which makes me fall with them out, <clears throat> uh, and in other countries as well. <clears throat> However, I think it's not too difficult to find people who will confirm the conviction that the international competence in English is nowhere deep enough for the engagement of students who really want to be grown-up professionals in the other culture. You can, there's a certain amount that you can discuss in English, but below that, it's, you're not going to be in on what's really happening in the discipline or in the profession. One of, one of my favorite anecdotes, which I may have told here before, so some of you may have heard it already, forgive me. Um, there was a, a small conference at, at Yale on um, internationalization in one of the early years that I was there, where um, one of the presenters, a Yale faculty member of political science, named Jim Scott, um, 
he gave us a kind of parable. He said, you know, suppose you've got um, some researchers at the University of Idaho or maybe Maine who have developed a potato which is, has more nutritional value than any potato that's ever been developed before. And so you've now got an international um, aid kind of program going to the farmers in Peru and saying, this potato has more nutrition than any other potato that you're planting. And so you really ought to plant this particular kind of potato. He said, that kind of knowledge, which is happening in research universities all over the world, is very largely carried out, that kind of research is very largely carried out in English. But he said the potato farmers in Peru know that on this side of the mountain, they don't get enough sunshine for that potato. And the, the farmers, the potato farmers down in that valley know that the fungal problems that they have because of the lake down there is such that this kind of potato is not going to thrive. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he said, you've got to have, in any of these projects, and it doesn't matter what discipline, the agricultural was simply the example that he chose, in any project like this around the world, you've got to have a blend of systemic knowledge and local knowledge. Now, Jim Scott was not remotely interested in languages, but it was furthest thing in his mind. But I was bouncing up and down in my city, thinking to myself, the systemic knowledge around the world may, yes, be mostly in English, but the local knowledge is in the local language. And unless you have both, you're not going to get very far. So when you have students, for example, who are applying for some kind of a institutional or um, uh, disciplinary grant to do um, volunteer work abroad in public health, they're going to be working out in the field. They're not going to be working in the university and talking to professionals of conference. They need the language. And when you get this across, um, there's a sudden recognition that, yeah, OK, right. Now, that goes beyond the conventional wisdom that English will do it. There's also something to be said here, which is not a direct reply to your, to your comment or your question, but is an interesting point. There are a lot of people who think that the internet is virtually entirely in English, and that you know, to all of these <coughs> knowledge exchanges on the internet, and therefore, you know, who needs a language? It's really interesting, as a presentation that I heard at the World Call Conference some time ago, that um, less commonly taught languages, and especially languages for which there are extensive diaspora populations around the world, are now finding that the internet is the place where their language can be kept alive, and where diaspora speakers from all over the world can make contact with their native culture and their native language in a way that was not possible before the internet, and where publications can happen in a way that was not possible before. So you know, that, I think, is also something that needs to be said when people say, oh, yeah, well, it can all happen in English. As far as your, the second part of your comment about the professors who don't speak the languages themselves. I don't think there's anything I can say. We all know the problem. Yeah, well, A lot of our professors are from other countries too. Mm -hmm. They're not just from Europe. Yeah. If you in the College of Engineering, how many native speakers of Chinese are from <laughs> Yeah. We yeah, and there are there are chemistry labs where the whole thing is happening in China. I I have heard that, yeah. But let's, let's think back a little. You know, these professors who don't speak the language, what programs did they come out of? We may have to say, OK, we're arguing a generation ahead of ourselves. But if we train our graduate students to think that speaking the language is really important, that you know, maybe we're, we're, working, in, in, we're working to train our, our successors. The other thing, of course, is money. If Graduate students and junior faculty do not have money to go abroad. What kind of teachers are they going to do? What kind of language competence are they going to be able to model for students? Um, then that's something, you know, we can't create that out of whole cloth. I wish we could. But um, that's, yeah, okay. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>